Assalamu alaikum everyone, Juma Mubarak. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'uzu billah min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyi'ati a'malina. May yahdihillahu falamudillalah wa may yudlil falahadiyalah. Ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wa ahduhu la sharika la anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanutuku allaha haqqa tukatihi wa la tumutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم من يتي الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما. My dear brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa taala tells us all things and praise belong to Allah subhanahu wa taala. We seek Allah's help and His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah and all for, and from the evil within ourselves and from the consequences of our evil deeds. And whoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messenger. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us that, you know, oh, you who believe, fear Allah as he should be feared and do not die except as Muslims in submission to him. And Allah also tells us that, oh, you have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. He will amend for you your deeds, forgive you your sins, and whosoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. Amma ba. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, I am grateful to be here once again to reflect with you on the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, keeping in mind that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the most beautiful names. In Surah Al-Araf we are told, Wulillahi al-Asma husna Allah has the most beautiful names. The guidance in that verse doesn't stop there. It continues to tell us, Fad uhu biha. So call upon him by them, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should call him by his beautiful names. And keep away from those who abuse his name, meaning stay away from those who make fun of the attributes or the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, twist them. And we know from our own experiences that, uh, you know, children, when they're young, they will sometimes take the name of someone they know and they will try to make a mockery of it. And usually the mockery will include uh, some type of a personal feature of the individual. So for example, if there's a child named Sky and this child happens to be struggling with obesity, then we know what the cruelty of children can be like sometimes. You know, they might not be so nice and mock Sky by saying, uh, you know, you're a big Sky. Or if that same child is named Roland, for example, they might mock Roland by calling this child Roland down the hill. So this kind of cruelty we see, you know, in children, while, you know, sometimes these not so nice children uh, might even go and use pop culture, for example. Um, if anybody has seen the movie Shrek, which is a popular kids movie. With um, the point I'm trying to drive here is that this type of behavior is childish to make fun of other people's names and we have all likely seen this in our lifetime and maybe some of us were those not so nice kids when we were young uh, you know but this is exactly the kind of behavior that the Quraysh exhibited when the Prophet Sallallahu was preaching about Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and the message of Islam and it wasn't just the Quraysh this was you know even before Islam there were other uh, communities who made fun of their prophets uh, and made fun of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, the Quraysh in this case took the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and twisted them and then used those twisted names to call their false gods. So one of the examples of this is the name Allah. And Allah is a name one for, for one of the idols, which was a, a mockery of the name Allah, which means the one God. And another name that they would use is al Uzza which was derived from Al-Aziz, which we know is one of the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Al-Aziz means the Almighty. And a third example I'll share with you is the name Manat, which was derived from Al-Mannan, the bestower. So this childish behavior uh, from the Quraysh 
you know, was how they mocked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So from our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we also learn that he says, Inna Allah jamilun yuhibbul jamal. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful and he loves beauty. So what we learn from this is that the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates what he loves. And if there's any doubt in our minds about it, we should look at the attribute al-Hakim, the wise. So Allah is the wisest of all and above all creations. So why would the wisest of all create anything that is not pleasing to him or not beloved to him? And there's absolutely no reason for us to think otherwise. And Allah never ceases to create. So the process of creation is continuous. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Nahal, and he creates what you do not know. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates is always in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, uh, the example we typically use is that of angels, for instance, except for two creations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has entrusted with the gift of free will. And those two creations are the humankind and jinn. So these two creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala they are in perpetual competition with one another, trying to reflect the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and we know the jinn um, from many stories in the Quran as well. You know, there's the incidents where obviously Iblis falling from grace. Um, we also know that there were jinn who were listening to the heavens and looking for guidance from or listening to the words of the angels and, and what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was saying. And when we reflect on these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is when we apply these attributes to our lives, then we are emulating, um, you know, al-Hakim, the wise. You know, taking a share for ourselves in the beautiful qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that in itself is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So extend this example further. Uh, you know, when we do the opposite of being wise, which is being foolish, we are rejecting the quality of wisdom from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And instead, we are giving ourselves the quality that is harmful. So another way to think about this is that when we choose to act foolishly, we are choosing for ourselves something that is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are effectively deviating from the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has give us, given us a chance to adopt and implement for ourselves and let it manifest within ourselves. So when we study the Asma al Husna, the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah teaches us these beautiful attributes and their manifestation so that we can embody them. Why else would Allah subhanahu wa teach us something if there is no benefit in it for us? And we know this from the Quran as well, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells the angels that I have taught Adam the names and then asks Adam alayhi salam to recite these to the angels in the, in, in the presence of these angels. So I, I say all this long introduction to talk about two names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that are often paired together. And the two names I want to talk about today are uh, not one of the 81 names that we know that are mentioned in the Quran. These names would differ in the different lists of the different scholars. So these two names we'll discuss today are Ad-Dar and an nafir And these are, uh, again, because I'm using the list from Al-Ghazali, these two names appear together in the list of Al-Ghazali. Now, why, why do these names appear together as a pair? The reason for that is because they have opposing nature. And whenever there are two attributes that have an opposing nature to each other, we find that they will usually be paired together uh, in a list. So uh, let's let's talk about first what they mean. So Adar means the punisher, the one who causes distress. And Anafia means the benefactor, the one who brings benefit. So the root words for these two words. Uh, these two names are Adar is Dad Rara, which has the meanings of to suffer, to be harmed, or to force. And the root, for, root word for Anafi is Nun Fa Ain, which has the meaning of to profit, to benefit. And because these two names are complementary and opposites of each other, uh, we get to benefit from seeing the full picture uh, about the concepts that surround these two names or these two qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so the word punishment, you might wonder, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the source of good. Then why is there an attribute called Adar, the punisher? Why do we think about Allah as the punisher? So we must remember that all the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
are beautiful. And that's why I wanted to highlight that first in the introduction. Every single name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful. They're perfect. They're perfect because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is perfect. So when we first encounter Adar, the punisher, we might think this is a negative word. Why? Because we don't associate anything good with punishment. So on its own, the word punishment is not a positive experience, has no positive connotations whatsoever. And this is not a shortcoming in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but is a shortcoming in us. We are not able to fully understand the reality of Allah's qualities. We have an approximation, we have some idea, we have some insight, and then we can draw from our own personal experiences to then reach some conclusion about the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, at the end of the day, ultimately, the reality of everything is best known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So with our limited knowledge, we can understand from Adr and An-Nafi that Allah harms so that we can benefit. Okay, so let that sink in for a moment. Allah harms so that we can benefit. So let's use an analogy again to help us understand this concept. Uh, and let's use the analogy of a child going to a dental visit. So as a child, you know, when you are at the dentist's office, it's a frightening experience. And we can all go back and think about the first time as a child when you went to the dentist's office. You know, you might hear sounds of drilling, some power tools running there in the, uh, you know, as you sit in the lobby. You know, the other room, you might hear screaming coming in, somebody who's uncomfortable. Or you might hear some other child crying in pain. And when it's your turn as a child to then be escorted into the room where the dentist is waiting for you, you know, you might see more tools laid out on the table. You might see other things that are unfamiliar. And there are tools there to poke and prod your teeth. There are to tools there to hold your mouth open and so on. And you might look at these tools and, and you might actually feel afraid as a child. Or at least I remember myself being afraid as a child. So you might wonder, why is it that mom or dad brought me here? Am I being punished for something? You might be, you know, thinking of this place as the most horrible place anyone can be taken to where sharp objects are pressed against your teeth. And the procedure might be, you know, just a simple teeth cleaning, you know, just a routine procedure once every six months. But even then, as a child, the idea of taking a sharp object and somebody poking it in your mouth and keeping it open is horrifying. Okay, so even as an adult, it hurts, you know, going there. But as a child, the fear is real. It's elevated compared to that of an adult. So if you if you reflect on it, um, you know, on your experience at the dentist's office, you might think that as a child, this was punishment because you don't know any better. You don't know that there is a benefit to uh, the work that this dentist is going to do on your teeth. And as you grow older, you realize that the dentist office isn't a place of punishment. You understand that this preventive care is actually good for you. And when you come in for a procedure, you know, where one side of your mouth is numb and your teeth are throbbing with pain, you know that at the end of it, you should probably thank the dentist for doing a good job. And when you realize this benefit, you are more, uh, you're more open to tolerating that pain. So you bear that discomfort. You fight through it with perseverance. You you just sit there patiently. And when the dentist is done with that procedure, instead of thinking about the experience as a punishment or you think about the pain or complaining about just the pain alone, you might thank the dentist for helping you maintain their health. And you might come back to them again if they did a good job or you were comfortable with them. So we must realize that there is no analogy that befits Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is above all analogies and metaphors that we can come up with. But these analogies and metaphors are the tools with which we can understand these types of concepts or any concepts that we have uh, in our world or in our experience or we're, what we might come across. Um, so, you know, like we as mankind need these analogies to understand. And this is what we also find within the Quran. Within the Quran, you'll find that there are many, many analogies and metaphors that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses, you know, from the spider, Ankabut, to the ants, Nehal. You know, we see these concepts, we see these metaphors. Uh, without them, we would struggle to grasp even the basics or at least grasp to some extent with quality what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to teach us and try to communicate with us.
So the reality of it is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond any metaphor, you know, we can use. And speaking of Surah Nahl, in Surah Nahl, Allah tells us, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْعَالَمِ And for Allah is the finest description, meaning Allah is perfect and is absolute perfection and is alone. And from the dentist example, we learned that to perceive something as beneficial for ourselves, it is entirely a matter of our perspective. So from the perspective of the child, the experience is punishment, it's pain, it's torture. The child doesn't understand the benefit. From the perspective of an adult who understands the preventive nature of the dental procedure and the benefits that come along with that, they're grateful. The adult is grateful to the dentist for doing a good job. So how do we take that and how do we apply it to us as Muslims? So as Muslims on the day of judgment, you know, if we are true believers, we will see the outcome of the trials and tribulations that we experience in this world. And we will see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept all of his promises. And the believers on that day will be rewarded for the actions that they had performed in this world. And on that day, all the believers will be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because in that moment, they would have realized that what was not clear to them is now clear. And they will prostrate to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in gratitude. So in the hereafter, when the believers recognize that all the hardship they experience in this world, all the confusion they experience in this world was all temporary. It was nothing compared to the benefit that they have been provided with in the hereafter. And we hear and we read about these benefits throughout the Quran. And Allah tells us what we need to do in order to gain access to those benefits. So those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those who are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether they're in a state of comfort or they're in a state of hardship, are the ones who are the most grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in the hereafter, all the believers will be in a state of gratitude. Should we wait until that day, until we have that day available to us to be grateful? No, it should begin in this world. So how do we nurture that gratitude within us? Is by realizing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not harm except to give us benefit. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Adar, the punisher. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Anafi, the benefactor or the one who brings good. So we don't have to look further than our brothers and sisters in Gaza to wonder why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is punishing them. Then as we feel that emotion of hopelessness take over, you know, we, we see people coming together from all walks of life, standing in support of the people of Palestine, of the people of Palestine, you know, who have been subjugated for the last seven decades to a regime that is bent on destroying them. And there's absolutely no other explanation for it. And we see people learning about the struggles of the people of Palestine, who for all intents and purposes are probably the only people who can speak on the topic of humanity. For the first time, as they learn about them, their struggles, and about their unwavering um, faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the face of such extreme hardship. And that is enough for some of these people to accept Islam. So that benefit is what we see from the extreme punishment that we see in other people suffer. So just to wrap our heads around that is a great deal of uh, pain even for ourselves because we know the emotional waves that pass through us. We know the emotional states in which we have been traveling through this whole time. So once again, it's a matter of perspective, my dear brothers and sisters. You know, It doesn't matter who the actors are in a conflict or who the actors are on the world stage. It doesn't matter what the situation is that's causing distress to people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only wants one thing, and that is good for us. And constantly we are reminded about this in the Quran. You know, be in the remembrance of Allah. Be in the worship of Allah. And that Allah has created us for one purpose, and that is to worship Him. And that too is in the Quran. So there's no hardship Except that it benefits all of us, all of humankind. So what can we take away for ourselves from the attributes of Adr and An-Nafi? So we learned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for all of us. What we perceive as hardship or distress or trial or punishment 
or difficulty, that all of those things are a means to a benefit for us. It's just a matter of having that perspective. And all of this that we experience in this world is a temporary state of being. And as believers in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and as believers in the day of judgment, we must learn to adopt an attitude of gratitude where there is no difference in our level of gratitude towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whether we are in a state of blessing or when we are in a state of trial, it's all the same. It looks exactly the same. And to attain that state is the struggle and the trial that we go through every day. So here's another analogy uh, for us to use to think about this. You know, take a rose bush as an example. Uh, rose is a beautiful flower. Many people uh, admire having roses. And the rose bush is also resilient to the different extremes in temperature and can uh, you know, outlast droughts even in some cases. But the rose bush has many thorns that surround each beautiful flower. So to get to the rose, we must patiently and carefully navigate the thorns that protect the roses. But once we make it past the thorns, the rose is ours to enjoy and share with others. So if you do have that rose in your hand at that point, it's very easy for us to then enjoy the fragrance that comes or, the, or admire the beauty that comes with it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate our understanding of the Quran so that we may all live our lives under guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge and give us wisdom that gives us the ability to apply this knowledge when we need it most. My dear brothers and sisters, I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and for the rest of the Muslims. And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. He is the forgiver. He is the most merciful. My dear brothers and sisters, you know, I hope you found benefit from this reflection. Adar and Anafi. I mean, those are, are two names that are in opposition to each other, but we know that they complement each other. So inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala multiply our good deeds, accept all of our deeds, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide our hearts towards Him. Ameen. Allahumma ameen. Inna al Muslimina wal Muslimat, wal Mu'minina wal Mu'minat, wal Qanitina wal Qanitat, wal Sadiqina wal Sadiqat, wal Sabirina wal Sabirat, wal Khashiina wal Khashiat, wal Mutasaddiqina wal Mutasaddiqat, wal Sa'imina wal Sa'imat, wal Hafizina furujahum wal Hafizat, wal Zikri, wal Zakirina Allahi Kathira wal Zakirat, Addallahu lahum makhdratan wa ajrin azima. Rabbana faqfir lana zunubana, wa kafir anna siyatina tuafala mal abrar. Rabbi <laughs> <laughs>